And the deficit is equal to the expenditure minus income, right, or expenditure minus taxes, revenue. So the government can, you want a deficit of 100 billion, the government can do it in two ways, two polar opposites, two polar methods of doing it. Either spend 100 billion dollars more, or take in 100 billion dollars less. Okay? In other words, if the budget is, if now expenditures are 600 billion, let's say, and tax revenue is 600 billion, if you want a 100 billion dollar deficit, you can either increase this to 700, or you can cut this to 500. This, this brings a political element to the picture. Left-wing Canadians tend to always be in favor of increasing government expenditure anyway. So they, so they do it now on a cover of helping the economy, increasing uh, spending, lifting a thing up to the full employment line. So left-wing Canadians will opt for, let's take, let's take a little grid here. Keynesians, liberals, conservatives. Okay, so during depressions, liberals will be in favor of increasing Increasing government spend. Conservatives will tend to be in favor of tax cuts. So you're leaving more money to the people and so forth and so on. So cut taxes. Uh, during inflationary periods, you can either do, if you want a surplus of 100 billion, or now, of course, a lesser deficit, you're up here now. <coughs> if you want a surplus of 100 billion, you can either Increase taxes to 700 billion. Or the way you can cut expenditures to 500 billion. So conservatives tend to favor cutting expenditures during inflation. And liberals, of course, are favor tax increases. They are anyway. So if you had really heroic, extreme free market, or whatever you want to call it, Keynesians, they were in power, they would then cut tax. During depressions, they would cut taxes very heavily, and then during uh, inflation, they cut spending very heavily. And that, you get that eventually to sort of a zero budget, okay? <laughs> sort of by accident. This is where it never happens. There's no conservative Keynesians hold this view. Liberal Keynesians tend to sort of ride, you know, tend to sort of be dominant. So you have spending going up in the depression, matched by taxes going up in inflation, which means that government spending is always going up relative to the private sector, not by accident. <sighs> So, uh, in the course of what you have is, you have conservatives, you have liberals, you have moderates. The moderates are a little mix of both. You have cut a little, increase a little spending, cut a little taxes, or whatever. Nobody ever cuts government spending, ever. I mean, it hasn't been done in America, it hasn't been done since the first two years of the Eisenhower administration. Ever since then, nobody even talks about cutting government spending. Reagan, when he talked about government, cutting government spending, what he really meant was cutting the rate of growth of government spending. <laughs> A very different concept. So this is out. This is now verboten, unthinkable. Okay. So now we have. Uh, now the question is, how do you maneuver if you have a depression? So they're moderates. You do a little mix of both. So the conservatives, the people who conservative came, the people who want to have a little bit more of a tax cut compared to a little bit more of a spending increase, and you have a general mishmash, came to a mishmash somewhere in the middle. Okay, this was a picture until, 19, until 19, the mid-1970s where something cataclysmic happened to the Keynesian movement. Namely, remember the, remember the old picture, you have a business cycle of inflation and depression. If there's, a, if there's a depression, you pump in spending. If there's an inflation, they get spending. What do you do if you have both at the same time? What do you do if you have inflation and a depression at the same time? Okay. Uh, now called stagflation, <coughs> inflationary recession. Uh, this appeared for the first time well, it appeared in the 30s, but nobody recognized it, because we were in a big depression anyway. There was a big inflation within it. But <clears throat> the first time it appeared in this current phenomenon, it was a very small amount of length. So I believe the depression of 1957-58, and uh, uh, there was a big depression, there was a big unemployment, etc., separate, separate bankruptcies, and prices, instead of going, which had always gone down in all previous depressions, then creeped up a little bit, didn't go up a lot, like 74, 75, but they, they crept up. It's very unusual. That's supposed to happen. And I remember uh, one of my favorite anecdotes about this is I studied under author Burns, Columbia. <clears throat> Burns is a conservative Keynesian, a moderate conservative Keynesian, as I sort of described it. He went to Washington to be head of the Council of Econom Economic Advisors in the Eisenhower administration. He later returned under Ford and Nixon to the most inflationary Federal Reserve person in history, I think, uh, talking constantly attacking inflation all the time he was there. 
thereby establishing a sound money reputation. Anyway, he comes back after a few years, I have administration, he gives a Keynesian lecture about what to do, and the same stuff I'm telling you here, except without the, the attack on it. And um, so I asked him a question, I said, well, Professor Burns, there's now a situation where there's unemployment, depression, recession, and yet prices are going up. What do we do about that? And he said, well, it's not going to last long. Three months will be over and all that, which was true. I said, okay. But what happens is, supposing sometime in the future this happens again, we have even more so. We have a big recession, etc., and prices are going up even faster. And he, he stopped for a while. And he, if you ever heard him speak, he speaks like W.C. Fields without the humor. And he said, well, in that case, in that case, we all have to resign. <laughs> now, it happened in 75. 7375, it happened in 7981. Of course, nobody ever resigns. I mean, that's, uh, I mean he didn't resign, nobody else resigned. <laughs> and uh, that's, one of, that's one of my laws. I have a bunch of sociological laws, Rothbard's law, one of which is nobody ever resigns. <laughs> and once in a while, of course, this law is broken, but it's not very often. <laughs> okay. So, uh, the, uh, this is increasingly true, and we now have a situation where in 7375, uh, we have a big recession, and prices are going up by 14% a year or so. And what do you do? Well, <laughs> Keynesians are a big trouble. What can say about that? They don't resign, they don't, they, they don't stop being Keynesians, they become, become very low key about being Keynesians, they're very confused. And so, what you do is, if you have a situation where, you have, where you're supposed to put on the accelerator and depression and take off and put on a brake and a boom, you have both at the same time, you sort of do both, you do both rapidly alternating and hope that something works. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, close your eyes up something works. Right? So the uh, result is the Keynesians are total state of confusion and they're all, they don't know what to do at this point. There's a, at this point we have a big deficit that's supposed to be inflationary. On the other hand, we have a, just have had a recession uh, and what well, should we do that? On the other hand, we have inflation. We don't want to heat that up. Total chaos, intellectual chaos. In our and, uh, so that's. Uh, <coughs> now I haven't really. Okay, I really should stop talking at this point. But that, that's really. I haven't explained inflation or recession yet. Okay, I'll do that in a minute if I throw, clears up. Anybody have any comments on this? Any, any uh, questions, comments? Any converted Keynesians that come on and confess? I, I thought yeah. I thought James James Watson. There weren't any Democrats and Republicans. They were just yeah, liberals and Americans. Most Americans. <laughs> <laughs> you think he's going to resign, James Watson? Okay. I have no idea. Did he get the shot in the foot award? My pardon? The, the shot in the foot yeah. award. I think it was very funny. I was hilarious. He uh, he also I I read this article and in fact there was a picture of the, uh, Secretary Schultz going. Uh, did he really say that? The side yeah. the army general that said we're sending in more troops into Vietnam. Oh, uh, they let him yeah. But uh, uh, there's something about James Water and he said uh, yes. In my administration we have equal opportunity employment. Uh, we got a few Italians. We got a few Jews. A few cripples. <laughs> that was I mean, that was Butts, wasn't it? So, no, 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 It was Watt. It was Watt. Oh, he has a Jewish guy who has right. a paralyzed left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, that was me. Butts was the one. See, maybe we're looking for a Jew with a paralyzed left. Not to eat in a warm place. Butts was a warm place to sleep and not to eat. Yeah, yeah. So, but the but the the way he said it, my wife saw him on television. I was I was teaching that day. Watt said it. The way he said it was very funny. He was speaking for the Chamber of Commerce or something. He said, we have this new commission on coal leasing and all nonsense. He said, it's very balanced. We've got three Democrats and two Republicans. We have one black, one woman, two Jews, and a cripple. Right. <laughs> Cutting them off. I think it's hilarious. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. uh, are you going to be talking about the banks and the, uh, the liquidity crisis and that sort of thing? Liquidity crisis. Oh, yeah, the debt crisis. Oh, God. So, when will we stop? I don't think this time for me. Yeah. It's right? actually one little question. Yeah. Um, you know how like, a bank can keep a certain amount of its cash and it's reserved yeah. and loan and that stuff? And, and by doing clever bookkeeping, it manages to multiply the money by right. the back of wherever it wants. Okay? So, like 20% reserve, it multiplies it by five. Right. Uh, shouldn't that, like that costs a 500% increase in yeah. money supply, right. how come it doesn't cause runaway inflation? Well, because of the inflation, it's a question of how much, how much is done. You know, it hasn't been done enough to run away yet, except in cases where there have been runaway inflation. Germany and Hungary and so forth and so on. Right. 
There are not. It's um. No, here I, we, we stop when. Oh, well, I I think actually just about any topic could take all night. Yeah, for pretty sure. Yeah. If you can answer generally some questions yeah. and then refer them to reading materials. Yeah. That's my new book, The Mystery of Banking, solves the whole banking question. Explains it. Actually, it's the first one that really explains it. What happens is. Money and banking textbooks will explain it, except they have to have the wrong point of view on it. Okay. My own little pamphlet, um, most hard money people have the right point of view, they don't explain it in detail. I, I do I combine explaining it in detail with uh, our money analysis. Um, basically, it's the, <coughs> uh, uh, the function is something like warehouse receipts. Okay. And warehouse receipts. Is this the Yeah, that's right. No. Oh. No, no, that's what it's oh, that's the old book. No, the new book is called The Mystery of Banking. It's a hardcover book. It's not here today, eh? No. no. It, just got, it just came out about a week ago. Who does it get? Oh, right. <laughs> I'm using it in my class. I haven't come to the class yet. I have my desk copy, but I haven't come to the uh, class yet, bookstore. I need that. So, uh, but basically, what happened was warehouses, the warehouse law is, is an undeveloped, had been an undeveloped state until fairly recently, uh, for some obscure reason. Like the common law, statute law, warehousing was was, a, was mixed up. For example, until ten years ago, the Chicago grain elevators, which are the grain warehouses for wheat and so forth, uh, they, you, people would deposit uh, uh, warehouse deposit grain in, in the warehouses and leave it for a while and so forth and so on and pick it out. And uh, the grain warehouses began to speculate in these uh, in these other in the, the depositors, the customers of wheat. It's very much as if you're, you're, you're positing you're something in a warehouse and somebody takes it out and lends it out, expect it, expecting you, you won't pick it up for a while. And they were doing this systematically. They were making money on the other guys. Uh, they, they were charging the, the grain, the wheat people uh, money for depositing. Then they take it out and, and lend it out. And it was not illegal. <coughs> uh, they found it was made illegal. It was called embezzlement, which I think it is. <laughs> and, uh, and then it became a no-no, and that was the end of that. However, in the case of banks, which were originally money warehouses, where people put gold on deposit and left it there, so the banks began to do the same thing. And a case came up uh, early 19th century England, a classic case about uh, is, is, is a, if you deposit something, is it a debt or is it a, is it a bailment? Bailment being a legal term for. I mean, if you leave, I mean, for example, if I leave something in some part with a plate with a a safety deposit box would be a bailment. I leave it there, it's supposed to be there, damn it. If it's not there, I come for it. Somebody has to pay. Somebody's a crook. Okay. So, uh, so is is a bank deposit a bailment or is it a loan? And he was arguing back and forth. The judge unfortunately ruled it was a loan. Although he admitted, as is true the legal situation ever since, well, it's a peculiar kind of loan because you have to sort of keep it on hand and he says, it, and you're not really paying the guy, and he thinks it's there all the time. So it's a very, a very confused decision of the judge. And ever since then, fractional reserve banking has been legal, okay. where you can issue warehouse receipts to non-existent money, non-existent gold, and, and lend, them, lend them out, and hope that you won't get caught. With hope that people don't, won't call for redemption, in which case you go bank. You don't go to jail, or you only go bankrupt. Okay, so that was a key legal difference. Did they have to be with the creation of the Bank of England? Well, the Bank of England did it on a massive scale. There weren't that many other banks before that. There were, so it was um, the Bank of England that started it. That's right. Yeah, so it was before that oh, yeah. decision. Yeah, okay. the decision came much later. For some reason, no, nobody really uh, didn't go to the courts until, until 1915 or something. I don't know why. I don't know why they didn't take it to the courts. Probably because there were no bankruptcies. <laughs> no, the Bank of England. Why would anyone complain? Well, the Bank of England went bankrupt at the very beginning. The Bank of England went bankrupt about two years after they got started. The government then stepped in and said, "You can suspend specie payments. You don't have to pay your debt, or your, uh, you can continue, and you will, you can enforce the debts on your debts and other and your and your debtors, but you don't have to pay the debt." They did this several times systematically every time the Bank of England got in the hawk. So uh, you know, finally they. For a monopoly in the Bank of England, only the Bank of England issued banknotes in a 50 mile radius of London and stuff like that. Anyway, the thing is, the fractional reserve banking doesn't last very long if it's a free, bank, free banking system. If you have a real free market of banking, you can't do very much, even with this legal problem. Because if, say, I set up a Rothbard bank, okay, and I start issuing fake warehouse receipts, why not? Okay, and lend them out. Who will buy them? One thing. Also, 
if I have a couple of clients and I lend them like this money, this rock hard dollar notes or something, redeemable in gold, pretty soon the, my 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 borrower is going to spend his money on something else. He'll give the notes to somebody else to buy something with, and the other guy's not going to be a rock hard bank client. He'll be a client of some other bank. The other bank calls upon me for redemption, and you get the money and go, I go bankrupt. This check, this free market check on fractional reserve banking is pretty powerful. So the fractional reserve banking never really got started in a real inflationary manner until the central bank comes in, Bank of England, Federal Reserve Bank, Bank of France, etc., and generates, pops up the whole system. It's like a government cartel, it's like a compulsory cartel. It is a compulsory cartel. Allowing the banks to inflate uniformly so no one bank is in the public. And so anyway, the, 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 racket, the racketeering part of this is that the the Federal Reserve System, for example, was sold to the United States on the basis of checking the excessive tendency of, of private banks to inflate. Actually, the reason was just the opposite. The private banks who couldn't inflate got together and got the government to pass this law so the Federal Reserve Bank could, could engage in a cartelized inflation. The exact opposite of this. It's just like antitrust law, the same, the same sort of stuff all over again. And the Fed, the Federal Reserve in the United States, the Bank of Canada here, whatever, essentially prints money in different sophisticated ways. And, and, and actually, plain, plain simple fact, prints the money, and, this is, and then the whole money supply pyramids upward. And it's still doing it, despite all the talk about checking inflation and that sort of stuff. But in fact, that business about banks going bankrupt, there was oh. one in Britain that printed oh, yeah. a lot of money and, and uh, went under. <coughs> and the other banks bailed it out because they wanted to keep. When, when was that? Well, once in a while, I mean, the United States, too, like, there, there, were, crook, there were really crooked, crooked, crooked banks. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they just walk off the assets, <laughs> okay? Or they lend money, very unsound loans, they lend money to people to go back or something like that. They can go under, and they're bailed out by the, the Federal Reserve or the Federal Deposit Insurance and all that, but it's very isolated. And what I'm talking about is a real bank run, where everybody says, in other words, be, I, I would, I'd be interested in this sort of thing. People, I was talking to Paul the other day about, about private action, sort of like, uh, agoric action. One agoric action I like to see is a mass run of banks. Everybody cashes in. Okay, we don't like banks anymore. We, we insist on cash. This would cause a lot of headaches. They could get around it, but there are a lot of original turmoil. They have to adjust. I mean, the Federal Reserve and the last analysis would just print the money and give it to the banks. But they, they'd be a lot of institutional problems. They, they have to act fast. And they, have a lot of, you know, they have a lot of headaches. Well, they, what, what they do in cases like that, though, is. Uh, Declare a bank holidays yeah, one way, sure. but they simply, the, the government simply locks the doors on that mm -hmm. bank and won't allow people to take money. Exactly. Which exactly. is uh, yeah. partially what happened with the um, trust company, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, with Rosenberg's. When the depositor wanted their money, the government mm -hmm. just said, I'm sorry, you can't get it for any amount of time. In fact, certain people who wanted to get their money out were not allowed to do it at all because they had been associated with some of the previous owners. So it's like suspicious species. Yeah, I mean, clear a bank holiday. The right? banks are yeah. legalized right. thieves, just as right. uh, government yeah. is a legalized right. thief. And uh, government simply comes in and says, "I'm sorry, you can't, right. you can't take your money back from the thief." There's also an interesting law which was passed during 1932, the last pre, I won't say free banking, but before the federal deposit insurance came in, so it locked the whole thing up. A lot of bank failures, runs on banks. The Republican administration, first of all, they blamed on the communists. Because the commies are out there, the Bolsheviks in those days, are, they're undermining the soundness of the banking system. They're inje <laughs> injecting fear and suspicion in the hearts of the public and the banks. They didn't need communists to inject fear and suspicion the banks collapsing all over the place. And second of all, they said that um, they passed the law making it illegal to spread rumors that a bank is unsound. Or, 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 or a bank <laughs> what? Yeah, exactly. it's on the books. Oh my god. Yeah, they <laughs> like them apples. <laughs> So, <laughs> the Canadian government did something similar. Trudeau passed an order when there was a, a cartel about the uranium price. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, cartels are illegal in Canada. Mm -hmm. So, Trudeau passed an order in council making it illegal to talk about the illegal activities of the Canadian government. No, you're kidding. Wow, hey. Seriously, it was the order in council. Yeah. It was about 1977. He passed an order in council which makes it illegal for any Canadian to talk about the uh, uranium cartel, mm -hmm. which was illegal at the wow. Canadian government. Place. Is that still in existence? Was that I don't know if that's still in existence. No, no, no. Well, Tell me what's going on. Turn that man in. <laughs> He's illegal. Why am not going to sit in the same room as a young criminal? <laughs> 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 Sorry, I'm not going to sit in the same room as a young criminal. 
stone slime. Or is the uh, the static a server of doctrine? If it's on the books, you got to enforce it. You might not like the law, but you have to enforce it to the hell if it's on the books, right? There's a some that matter there. Yeah. <laughs> Protect the public. Nicely. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> I mean, what would we think if we were to have it? All these people went around talking about the fact that the government didn't do things right. I mean, right. this guy's obviously a bullshit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, undermining the confidence in the Canadian government. <laughs> exactly. I should, I should. Why am I? This is like in two minutes to sort of sum up a whole bunch of literature. But what the Austrian business cycle theory is, and what the explanation of all this inflationary recession is. It's one minute statement. You can read it in my American Great Depression or in uh, Hayek's uh, monetary theory and trade cycle, human action. Uh, basically, it is. And this is what one of the things wrong with the Friedmanites. Friedmanites say yes, yes, banking, excessive banking uh, expansion, money supply causes inflation. They don't see any other problems with inflation. It's only the prices go up and down, and they, people can't calculate as well. Actually, what happens with inflation through the banking system is that it messes up the whole production structure. Interest rates are distorted, production is distorted, and what you have is an excessive investment in capital goods and, and what's being called higher orders of production machine tools, construction, cement, things like that. And, and a, not enough of, a, of, a, of an investment in consumer goods. So you have a distortion of this production structure. Usually, as a lattice work, everything clears and, and clicks and so forth. Because the, the, the government inflates, lends money, and the banks inflate the behest of the government, lend money to business men. Business men then expand un, un, unnecessarily, as if there were a lot of savings to invest, and there really isn't. This causes this distortion, ex, over overinvestment of capital goods. And as soon as the inflation stops, as soon as the monetary inflation stops, this is revealed by process I can't go into, I just have to sum that up, state it, file it. As soon as you stop pumping in more money, uh, these construction companies, capital goods industries, start making severe losses. They, in other words, their overexpansion is now revealed. The recession then becomes necessary and healthy in order to wash out these malinvestments, to liquidate these unsound investments, and get back in a proper proportion. So the resources are shifted back to consumer goods unless the excess amount of investment goods are eliminated. So recession then becomes the inevitable, unfortunate, but necessary and inevitable uh, consequence of the boom and a healthy consequence of the boom. The boom, the boom is the problem. The recession is the correction. This is, of course, totally opposed to the Keynesian doctrine, which you have to, and Friedman doctrine, you have to pump and do something to correct recession. So. Uh, so this means that the, the Austrian policy conclusion derived from that is if, you're, if there's an inflation, stop inflating. There will be a recession. Think about recession. Let the recession do its healthy work fast and get it over with so we can have a recovery. Let the, these resources shift back to the proper free market level. The more you try to hold up the recession and delay it, the more you try to interfere with it, keep wage rates up, uh, bail out uh, unsound companies and so forth, the more you're prolonging the recession perverted, converting it into a chronic depression. The more you're delaying the recovery. So the choice then becomes, after the inflation, inflation boom, the choice becomes a quick, sharp, sort of surgical cut, and the recovery is on, or a chronic depression continues on and on. And what happened in the 1930s is Herbert Hoover, far from being a great apostle of laissez-faire, was the first big new dealer. He was the same, his policy was the same as Roosevelt, except less lower degree. So as soon as the recession hit, stock market crash hit, he immediately intervened with all these new deal legislation, bailing out. Bankrupt firms, uh, keeping wage rates up, keeping prices up, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, pumping in more credit, uh, lowering interest rates, the whole business, public works projects. Uh, what this did was delay the, re the recession, prolong it, and Roosevelt, of course, intensified as you have a 20, 11 year depression. So something which would have been like a nine month recession is converted to a chronic, seemingly permanent depression. And capitalism, the free market, gets the blame for it. Instead of the government intervention which creates it, uh, it's the, the free market, which is, of course, uh, it's lovely to blame. And, the, and the, those conservatives keep, still keep maintaining, despite all the evidence that Hoover is a great laissez faire person, of course, of digging their own grave on this because they're, they're uh, holding up somebody that everybody else thinks belongs to the pressure. They were right. So, anyway. It's, it's <clears throat> the difference between you know, recession and depression is simply how long it lasts. Yeah, it's how long, how intense it is. It's big. It's a depression, sort of more mild sort of session. Actually, the word depression has now been outlawed by economists. They don't use it, but it's too depressing. <laughs> the, uh, the old days, see, these people don't talk about depression. They talk about mild depression and severe depression. And then depression stopped being used as a bad PR. So now it's a recession. 
big recession. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's all semantics. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Sometimes back in the '60s, uh, they started talking. About, they started saying maybe there are no recessions anymore either. Maybe they're just sideways corrections or whatever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, 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 that was too euphemistic. Call that technical correction. Technical correction. <laughs> <laughs> well, this. Um, That's it. Should we have a general evaluation by people about what they thought was the Yeah, can we do that?